So we talked a little bit about the uniform distribution uh, last time. So let's start deal with the continuous distributions because technically the one for binomial, the one for hypergeometric, the one for Poisson, in the context that we presented them, they were for, you know, generally speaking, integers, like, you know, one ace or two ace or three aces or four aces. Now let's get to continuous stuff where we can start going into the decimals. And the first one we have is the continuous uniform distribution. And like before, it looks something like this, a little bit of a rectangle from our low to our high. The difference is that we can go as far into the decimals as we want. So for example, let's say our low was zero and the high was one. You could call this the standard continuous uniform, but we're just gonna stick with continuous uniform. We could get say 0.3565, we could get 0 0.7465. It can be anything. And here's an important property. The probability of getting one thing in the uniform distribution is always going to be equal to the probability of getting something else. The probability of getting zero is the same as the probability of 0.3565 which is the same as the probability of 0.7465, which is the same as the probability of one. Now, here's things that are a little bit interesting. The probability of getting these is basically zero. Now I'm sure at, at first glance, that might make no sense to you whatsoever. You're like, if everything has a probability of zero, then how can they add up to one? Well, the very formal probability is that it's one over infinity because there are an infinite number of decimals between zero and one. And if you want to extend that further, for any two numbers, there is an infinite number of numbers in between them. It can be integers, it can be decimals. So if we have flight times, say from 30 minutes to 40 minutes, every single one of those flight times, the odds of getting that exact flight time are basically zero. It's one over infinity because there's an infinite number of possibilities. However, so like for example, let's say I ask you, what is the probability of getting 0.5 justify your answer? You would say basically zero because there's an infinite number of decimals between zero and one. In the example of the flight times, let's say the flight times are 30 to 40 minutes. And I ask you, what are the odds of getting a flight time of exactly 31 minutes and six seconds? You would say basically zero because there are an infinite number of flight times between 30 minutes and 40 minutes. I know it sounds a bit paradoxical, but with any continuous distribution, the probability of getting one very, very, very specific result is essentially zero. So before I continue, are there any questions with regards to that concept? Oh, this, this is not a philosophy class. <laughs> That's not a philosophy class. Technically, every single one of them has a chance of happening. It's just one over infinity. So the odds of getting exactly 30 minutes and 6.5444444 seconds is one over infinity. And the generalization that we make in this class is that one over infinity is zero. And here's how we get one over infinity. Since it's a continuous uniform distribution, everything has the same probability. So therefore the sum, we know the sum of all of our probabilities must be equal to one. This is from chapter four. And we know that in this case, here, let's move this down. Oh, there, there's actually some graphs, which I'll get to in a second. But here, if we move this down, we know the probability of getting, say, xA is equal to the probability of getting xB. And we also know that there's an infinite number of x's since we go as far the decimal as we want. So therefore, we have an infinite number of p of xi's. If these p of xi's are all weighted to be the same, 
then any P of XI is equal to one over infinity. So that's where that probability comes from. And one over infinity is so infinitesimally small that we say zero. So then you might ask, what is the point of this? Why would we talk about continuous uniform distributions or any type of continuous distribution if everything basically has a probability of zero? Here's why. When we're dealing with continuous distributions, we don't ask for a very, very specific time. If we do, we say basically zero. Instead, we ask ourselves something like this. What are the odds of being between one of these two? That's what we ask ourselves. So for example, you might have a flight from say Lubbock to Dallas and you want to get a layover to Houston and you want to be as greedy as possible, but you don't want your flight to go too late. So you might ask yourself, what is the probability that my flight isn't any longer than 55 minutes? And that is where the continuous uniform will help you. So to help us answer that question, Let's bring up a few probability laws for, uni for uniform distributions. And for this, we're going to go off to the right-hand side and write them all over here because we have more space. So here, laws for continuous distributions. Our first law is that the probability of our x value, whatever it is, being between A and B inclusive, so it could be A or B if it wants to, is equal to the probability of A is less than X is less than or equal to B. Now you might say, hold on, why? How can we exchange our signs here? The reason why is that if the probability of getting exactly A is essentially zero, then whether or not we include A in the boundary doesn't matter. Now you might say, hold on, Professor Bailey, by that logic, couldn't we say that this is also equal to the probability of A plus one over infinity less than X? No, because one over infinity plus one over infinity, that's no longer exactly zero. So this only holds for the one specific value. And therefore, by that same logic, we could say, it's equal to the probability of A less than or equal to X is less than B. Because by that same logic, if the probability of getting exactly B is basically zero, then whether or not we include it on the boundary doesn't matter. Because when we're saying it's from A to B, A and B are our two boundaries. And so therefore, by combining both of these, we can get the easiest form and say this is equal to the probability a is less than X is less than B. And all of these are the same as saying, let me make this big. This is the, oh, that's a lot of S's. This is the same as saying the probability of being between A and B. We are going to stick with this one because it's the easiest one to write. So, and, and now, likewise, we can go, we can simplify if we want. For example, the probability of A being less than or equal to X, so X being greater than or equal to A, is equal to the probability that A is less than X. This is one-sided. So, for example, in, in the question before, let, let's say you didn't want it to be longer than 55 minutes. So then a way you could write that is saying that you don't want your flight time to be any longer than B minutes. And therefore, because the probability of getting exactly B is basically zero, that's the same as the probability of being less than it. So with the case, the uh, let, let, let's say your, your flight time, you don't want it to be longer than an hour, then you could say P, the X is less than 60 minutes. So before we continue to dealing with probabilities for the like actual probabilities of stuff for the uniform itself, are there any questions about these laws and concepts?
if you prefer to you know, verbally ask the question instead of typing it out, you're always welcome to click the raise hand button and just ask. Yes, someone has raised their hand, Benjamin. So would this be all theoretical because they're all equal to zero or what, it, or what's, what does this mean essentially? So the probability of getting exactly spot on 60 minute flight time is basically zero. On the other hand, the odds of it being between 55 minutes and 60 minutes is not exactly zero and here's why. Technically, there's also an infinite number of times between 55 minutes and 60 minutes. So in that sense, the infinities begin canceling out. And then when we say 55 to 60, we can get an actual real probability that makes sense. But all of these are based on that same concept. So when we're dealing with continuous distributions, you're not going to get an actual probability unless we're asking you if it's between two points. Uh, Kylie, which part is confusing you? <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the probability part. Uh, let, let's pull up these graphs. These graphs will make it help. Let's zoom into this one right here. So let's say we have these flight times. <laughs> let's say with these flight times, 120 minutes to 140. Our flight time can be 120 minutes, four seconds, four nanoseconds, four picoseconds, as far out as we want. Yes, Benjamin. Would this be the same thing as the area questions, the area graphs you had last time with like explaining the uh, the chances of probability of getting certain, uh, certain outcomes? Would that be the same thing as what this is here, where it's the same For area? For the next like, part, the yes. Points, so For the matter. next part, yes, but not this particular part. Okay. So, the odds of getting any very, very, very specific flight time are basically zero. So for example, let's say you walk onto your plane, you board your plane, the pilot pulls up the microphone and he says, our flight's gonna take 55 minutes to Dallas. The odds of it being literally exactly 55 minutes with not a single second or a 10th of a second or anything like that. The odds of getting perfectly 55 minutes are basically zero because it could be 55 minutes in one second. It could be 54 minutes and 59 seconds. It could be 55 seconds in one picosecond. So when the pilot says 55 minutes, what he's really saying is it's gonna take about 55 minutes. Kind of like how if you're sitting outside waiting for a parent to pick you up from the airport and they tell you, I'll be there in 15 minutes. They're not literally saying exactly perfectly 15 minutes right on the nose. They're basically saying about 15 minutes. Does that help explain it? <laughs> it, it yes, Logan. I don't get how, like, you said, like, it could be... Infinite. Can you speak louder? You said it, like, the probability could be, like, infinite, like, it's pretty much zero. So why does that not apply to, like, when you're trying to find something within it as well? What do you mean within like, it? Um, like, for the for the P of, like, A is great, or less than or equal to X, how would that also not be, like, pretty much zero? Here's why. Uh, so we have our example here. So, well, first of all, before I go through the example, you all understand that with a uniform, everything has the same chance, right? So getting 120, so getting between 125 and 130 is the same as 135 to 140. That part makes sense, right? So here, may, maybe the, these probabilities being essentially zero um, will make more sense if we go over an example of stuff in between. Someone say something? Professor, uh, yes. Uh, I think I can try explaining it a little. Sure, or go ahead. a different example, at least that, that I think it's a little easier. If you're trying to like stop a stopwatch at exactly five seconds, you the chance of you being able to do that exactly is very low. But if you're trying to stop it, say between three and five seconds, the chance of you doing that is a lot higher. Exactly. Because the difference is that one of them, it's a range. All you have to do is get somewhere inside that range. Whereas getting exactly five seconds on the nose 
no decimal places, getting exactly that, it's just not happening. I mean, technically it might happen, but you know, these stopwatches, I think they go out to like a, a, a hundredth of a second, right? Yeah, so I mean, technically it might round off to be exactly five seconds, but as a practical matter, it might have been, you know, four seconds and 0.996 seconds. So 4.996 seconds. The stopwatch will round that up to five seconds, but it probably wasn't exactly five seconds. Yes. So let's go through an example of the range. Uh, and, I have a question. Yeah. So basically, these formulas are the probability of getting within that range. Yes. The, the, the reason why I write them all in this different way is because the reason why we're able to write it in that way is because the odds of getting exactly A are basically zero. So therefore, whether or we not we include exactly A doesn't matter. Okay, gotcha. So I'm going to give you a formula for the uniform. We'll work through it, and then we'll come back to these probabilities being basically zero. And perhaps going over this example of ranges will make the, the exact make a bit more sense to borrow a phrase from Jack. So uh, the probability for the uniform, so for uniform, I'll use a U, the probability in the uniform that A is less than X is less than B is equal to B minus A over max minus min. Or you can put high minus low, whichever one you prefer. So as an example, Let's consider this graph right here. I'll wait just a sec so y'all can write that down. But with this graph right here, we're asking what is the probability that our flight time X is from 120 to 130 minutes? The U means the uniform. U stands for the uniform probability between A and B. So in this case, in this example, we're asking what is the uniform probability of being between 120 and 30 minutes or 130 minutes? This is the same thing because of the exact point theory of being between 120 and 130. So essentially, this is asking us what are the odds that our flight time is between 120 and 130 minutes? Now, in this case, just by looking at the rectangle, it's asking for the bottom half of times. So our answer should come out to be 50% because that is half of the rectangle. Combine the two halves, you get the whole. So in this case, our B is 130. Our A is 120. Our max is 140. And our min is is 120 or you know high being 140 and low being 120 so 130 minus 120 is 10 140 minus 120 is 20 which is 50 percent so we can say the probability of having a flight time between 120 and 130 minutes is 50 percent now as a note the odds of getting exactly 125 minutes are basically zero because it could have been 124 minutes and 0.99999 seconds, or it could have been 125 minutes and 0 0.0001 seconds. However, th this is why when the pilot says you've got a 50 minute flight time, he's, he, what he's saying is about 50 minutes. He doesn't mean exactly down to the zero second 55 minutes. He means about 55. So in this sense, let's say he says, it'll take about 125 minutes plus or minus five. This is what he's saying. There's a 50% chance that that'll be the case, assuming every flight time has an equal probability. So before we go back to those probabilities of being zero, do these ranges make sense? Like do the probabilities coming from these ranges, does that part make sense? Okay, well, I, I thought that presenting this would make the probability of being zero make more sense. So now let's go back to that probability of being zero. Let's, let's zoom into this rectangle. The odds of getting exactly 120 minutes and 0.98957, blah, 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 it's one over infinity, okay? 
and the probability of getting 127 minutes and 0.7875, so on and so forth, minutes is one over infinity. However, let's suppose that we added one over infinity, one over infinity times. So to put it in the summation form you're used to, what if we added up one over infinity, infinity times? <laughs> Or we, we can do one, keep it easier. If we add one over infinity, infinity times, then we get one. And that this concept right here is what allows us to get this range of probabilities. Because what happens is we have an infinite number of flight times from 125 to 126 minutes. So once we add all of those together, our infinity is gone. This is why we're able to calculate the probabilities of the ranges because the infinities begin canceling out. So in this case, from 120 to 130, we have an infinite number of flight times in between those two. And what we're doing here is we to use the same concept as before. Let's say we had the discrete distribution and we asked between 125 and 130 or 120 and 130. That'd be 120 plus 121 plus 122, or the probability associated with that. So P of 120 plus P of 121 plus P of 122, and so on and so forth. In that sense, we're still adding probabilities. The difference here is we're adding an infinite number of probabilities, but they all have an infinitesimally small chance of happening, and therefore the infinities cancel out. Does that help make it make a bit more sense? Which part's still a little bit confusing? Yes, Benjamin. So I think I kind of have an idea what you're trying to describe. So imagine like a sphere, you know, where it's a ball and has infinite points across it. It's a circle, so circles have infinite points. But whenever you have all those circles combined together, you get an entire sphere or an entire object, right? Yeah. So one infinity plus infinity all the way around is going to be one sphere. So, yeah, like, like imagine you're, you're, you have a bow and arrow and you're shooting it at a target at an archery range and you shoot it and it lands in its spot. The odds that it was going to get that exact perfect spot down to the picometer was basically zero. But when you go to the archery range and you shoot that arrow, you don't get points for getting that exact spot. You get points for being inside the bullseye. And there's tons of points inside the bullseye. We just, they, they just want you to get inside the bullseye. That's why no one ever asks you to hit the exact perfect down to the picometer, perfect center of the bullseye. They just say, get in the bullseye. Yes, Jordan. Okay. <clears throat> so what you're saying is one over infinity plus one over infinity, the infinities would start canceling out, right? Yes. Okay. So can't there be a one infinity and then like right next to it like the next point would also the probability be one over infinity yes and for the continuous uniform yes yes so how do we know that it is like the entire 140 or the entire 130 that we're looking at it's just the range so for here let's say we are in your example let's suppose we had 124 to 125 minutes the reason why we know we can include everything in the 124 range is because our flight time includes all of the 124s because here it says 120 to 130 so therefore everything that starts with 124 minutes whether it's 124.8 minutes or 124.2 minutes and everything in between all of those are included by this range so all of those infinities in the 124 cancel each other out and we're left with an actual number that we can do something with. Okay. I'm just, I'm like trying to wrap my, I'm sorry, I'm trying to like, it's like it adds up to one and, we, and when you have probabilities, they add up to one. So it could just be like a small spot or it could be a large point, but it would be given in the question. Yes. Okay. Now, the good news is that the only time you will have to worry about the probability being exactly zero is when we're dealing with the normal distribution or the uniform distribution. Everything else, it's discrete, and you'll that any specific point will actually have a non-zero chance of happening. I, I think 
much of the confusion stems from the infinity. Infinity in and of itself is a very tricky concept to wrap itself around. It, it, that, that's just, the, the entire concept of infinity is just a bit tricky to figure out. Uh, so with those questions, does anyone have any other questions with regards to uh, this continuous stuff? All right, let's go ahead and move on. Now, a couple of special cases. So we have this formula here, right up here. Let's zoom out a little bit. We have a couple of special cases. In this case, our range included our minimum. So we could say this is equal to u of x being less than 130 because 120 is the low bound. So as a special probability law, the uniform distribution of x being less than some value that we'll, we'll call it b, the probability of this is the b minus the min over max minus min. This, this, this is essentially the same thing as saying that A is our minimum. And likewise, going from the other end, the uniform probability of X being greater than A, oh, let me put the, the sign first. So X being above it, is going to be equal to our maximum minus a over max minus min. So in the example of our flight times, let's say I asked you what the probability is of being 135 to 140. That's the same thing as asking you what are the odds of it being higher than 135. And so in this case, you could say the uniform of 135 is less than x. So let's go to a practice problem with the uniform. And I'll give you a moment to work on it. I believe it's a bit lower down here. Where'd I put it? Uniform somewhere around here. Let me see where I put it. It's somewhere. If it's not here, I'll just make up one up. I'll just make one. Who cares? <laughs> All right. Let's go over here and put one right here. Give me a moment, I'll, I'll just type it out and then you can go ahead and work on it. So. All right, here you go. Here's one right here. I'll give you a couple minutes to work on this and then we will go over the answers. All right, does anyone need more time? All right, I'll give you an extra minute.
All right, let's go ahead and go over the answers. For part A, so for A, it's gonna be basically zero. If you, if you want, and on here and on the exam, if you put one over infinity, I'll take that as well. And the reason why is because we have an infinite number of times between 10 and 20 minutes. And so therefore, getting exactly 15 with no seconds whatsoever, if there's an infinite number of times and we're asking for one extremely specific time, it's one over infinity as a practical matter, you're just not going to get it. Now, before I continue, a question you might ask is, hold on. If every single time has a one over infinity chance of happening, then how is it possible for me to arrive at my house? How is it possible for me to arrive? If everything is basically zero, how is it possible for me to arrive at my house? I should be dead. <laughs> a bit of a philosophical question. Here's the mathematical answer, because now that we have our ranges, we can answer the question someone asked earlier. You have an, an infinitesimally small chance of arriving at exactly 15 minutes, but you have an infinite number of possibilities between 10 and 20. So you're multiplying one over infinity by infinity. And so our infinities go away. Yes, someone have a question? Okay, so now part B, we're asking no longer than 18 minutes. So we're asking for the probability that our X is less than 18. Or you can say less than or equal, but because this is a continuous uniform, this is the same as the probability of X being less than 18. Now, since everything has an equal chance of happening, this tells us it's going to be the continuous uniform distribution. So, therefore, for our continuous uniform, we have the uniform of X being less than 18. In this case, our 18 is our B. Technically, our, our minimum, which is A, is our minimum. And so in this case, our formula, going back over here, a little bit higher, we will use this one. So let's head back over. In this case, that is going to be equal to B, which is 18, minus our minimum, which is 10, over our max of 20, minus our minimum of 10. So 8 over 10, 80%. There will be a continuous uniform distribution problem on the exam. It's not going to be all that far removed from the one you just did here. These two parts are the crux of what you'll see for that problem on the exam. So before we continue to the actual normal distribution, are there any questions with regards? So for which equation to use, technically, Going back over here, these two are shortcuts. These are shortcuts. Oh, I put the save button on accident. Who cares? This one will always work. It'll always work. So if you don't want to use the shortcuts, you can always use this one. Because technically, with our one from before, this was the same thing as saying the probability that x was between 10 and 18. So if you want, you can just write down the one formula and know to write it in this format. Yes, Jordan. Oh, I was just wondering if you could go back to those formulas real quick so I can sure. take a picture of them. Yes. What do you mean a different one for B? Uh, Kylie, what are you referring to? Oh, I think I know what you're referring to. The reason why we could use this one is because this, this one's just a shortcut. This is a shortcut. So I'll, I'll draw the arrows. These two are shortcuts. Because for part A, we were asking for an exact time. Whereas for the other one, we're asking for a range of times. So to put it another way, 
If you're asked for a perfect exact time, it's basically zero. If you're asking for a range of times, then it's not going to be zero. Uh, John, I'll come to your question in a sec. So let me give you an example. Let's suppose, and I'll just make up this part C. Let's suppose I gave you a part C and I asked you, what are the odds of about 15 minutes? So let, let's say that about means plus or minus two minutes. In that case, that's the same as asking of what are the odds of it being between 13 and 17 minutes. And so in that case, we would use B minus A, 17 minus 13 over max, which is 20 minus min of 10. I'll zoom out so you can see the whole thing. So four over 10, 40%. There you go, so you can see the full thing. So that is what, when, when if you're on anything involving time, when, we, when, when you're talking to your parents and you're picking them up so they can visit you and you tell them, I'll be at Preston Smith in 10 minutes. When you say 10 minutes, you're saying 10 minutes plus or minus something. Some people, when they give their plus or minus, that's five minutes, a lot of range. Other people, they have it pretty exact. They might say, I'll be there in 12 minutes. Think of it this way. If you're driving to the airport and the airport's 20 miles from your house and the traffic is bad, it might take about 30 minutes to get there. But when you say about 30 minutes that far away, you're, you're saying maybe plus or minus five. On the other hand, if you're only two miles away from the airport, you might say, I'll be there in 16 minutes. And when you say 16, you're implying that's a pretty good guess. So maybe plus or minus one. But in both of those instances, those are technically still ranges. But it, it's a quirk of English. We, we just throw out the about and we just say odds of 15 minutes. But in this course, I'm not going to say odds of 15. I will either say odds of exactly 15 or odds of about 15 or odds of 13 to 17. I won't pull those English shenanigans on you. We're not, this isn't an English class. <laughs> All right. Now let's move on to the normal distribution. So let me see where I can find some space. And we have some space right here. We'll use this space. So the normal distribution, like before, it's continuous. So the probability of any given thing is going to be zero. So again, let's deal with ranges. So let's suppose we have two Z scores, ZV and ZW. Let's suppose I ask you three things. What's the probability of being between these two Z scores? Or let's say I ask you, what's the probability of being below ZV? Or I ask you, what's the probability of being above ZW? I'm sorry, that's the wrong way. And so on and so forth. Or we can do less than or equals to. Like with before, we don't need the equal signs. We can just say this is the probability of, B, of Z being between these two, so greater than ZV, less than ZW. And likewise here, this is the same concept as before. I'm just showing this so that way we don't have to worry about the equal, the, the less than or equal to signs. So here the same as Z is less than ZV. And here that's P, ZW is less than Z. I just write this down. You, you don't have to write this down. It's to show that we can throw out the less than or equal to's and just keep the less than's. Now, here's a nice thing though. Let's suppose we have our uniform distribution. Let's say we have one Z score here. Let's suppose this is ZV. And let's suppose our ZW is right here. And we wanna know what the probability is of being between these two. So in this case, we can call this the probability of RZ being less than ZV. 
and we can say this whole thing, so all of this, we can call that the probability of z being less than zw. So therefore, we see there's an overlap right here. So if we take out the overlap from this, then we get this. So put another way, if we take the probability of getting all of this, and then we get rid of the overlap, we get what we're looking for. So therefore, there's a formula for this. The probability of being between two, and this is the one you want to write down, the probability of being between two z values is equal to the probability of being less than the bigger one minus the probability of being less than the smaller one. Before I continue, does this general concept make sense? If you have any questions about it, you can feel free to raise your hand or type it out. So we've dealt with these Z values being integers. And in unit one, you calculated probabilities of being between any two integer Z values. And in the previous lecture, we talked about decimal Z values. So now we're gonna combine those both together and ask ourselves, what is the probability of being between two decimal Z values? Put another way, given any two Z values, what's the probability of being in between those two? As long as we have this probability and we have this probability, we can calculate the probability of being in between them. Now, for the uniform distribution, we I could give you the exact definition of the uniform distribution like the textbook does, but we don't need that. And the reason why is because there are such things as Z tables. And these Z tables give us all of our Z scores and decimals and give us the probabilities associated with being less than those. And for that, we have these two tables right here. I will upload a PDF file to Blackboard with these. You'll be allowed to print this out you'll be allowed to have it with you on the exam. So let's first explain what this table means. Let's explain what it means. So for here, this table is for the lower half of the Z scores. So this table on the left deals with Z scores over here. Yes, yes, it could be separate, absolutely. If you want, you can print this out on two different pages and write your cheat sheet on the back of both. You can print this front and back and have your cheat sheet be separate, whichever one you prefer. These probabilities deal with Z scores on the right-hand side. So therefore, this is for negative Z values and this is for positive. So if we recall from the unit one assessment, so assessment number one, we recall that our probability of our Z score being less than negative one, if we recall, that was 16% because of the empirical rule. Let's pull up the table. We want to find the Z value of negative one. In this case, we see the negative one is right here. There's no decimal whatsoever. It's exactly negative one. So our decimal is 0 0.00. Therefore, the probability, 16%. Now, before I continue, does it make sense how I got to that 16%? I found we, we got the integer, which is on the left-hand side, and we got the decimal, which is on the right-hand side. Well, then, okay, now let me rephrase that. We got the first decimal, the tenths place on the left-hand side. We got the hundredths place on the right-hand side. Does it make sense where this 16% came from? So as another example, 
we recall that the probability of z being less than, say, 2, we know that, if I recall off the top of my head, was about 97.5%. So 2 is positive, so we're going to use this table. OK? Uh, let me undo. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't to do. Because I, I want to get rid of the lines on the left-hand side. So I will copy that. Undo. There we go. Get rid of those. Now I paste that back. There we go. So in this case, we look for the Z value. That's two. That's right there. We have no decimal. So 0 0.00. Find the cell that corresponds to them both. Yep, 97.5, roughly speaking. Now, you might ask yourself, hold on. These aren't exactly 0.5. They're off by like 0.1 or 0.2. The reason why is because the empirical rule was an approximation. The Z table gives you the perfect exact value. So now let's give an example of a couple of decimals. Let's suppose I asked you the probability of getting... And here I'll remove these because those are examples. Let's get some more examples. Let's suppose I asked you the probability of Z being less than 1.6. 1.6 is a positive number, so we're going to use this table. So we have 1.6. That's right there. There's no decimal after the 0.6. That's 0, 0. So therefore, it's 0.9452. Now let's do another example. Let's suppose we did 1.75. In this case, it's still positive, so we're gonna use the chart on the right. We have 1.7, so that's the start of it. But now we have a 0 0.05 on the end, so we locate 0 0.05. We now see which one corresponds to them both. And that'll be 96%. And now to give an example with negative z-scores, let's suppose we ask the probability of z being less than negative 2.55. In this case, we have negative, so we use this table. And therefore, we have negative 2.55, so we have negative 2.5. That's right here. And then we have a 0 0.05 at the end. That's right there. And we locate the value as being about 0.5%. Before I give you a couple of practice ones to work with here, locating values yourself, are there any questions about locating probabilities of being less than a Z value? All right, I'll give you a couple of practice ones. So what I want you to do, just on your own, find the following probabilities. So let's say Z is less than negative 2.21. P, Z is less than negative 0.13. And P of Z being less than 2.91. So get these three probabilities. It should only take you about a minute. If you're on your screen, you can put your finger on the screen and triangulate it with your fingers. So I'll give you about a minute or two to do this. Yes, let me pull that up. It's just typing it out. Yeah, and what I will do is I will take this chart and I will upload the PDF file of it to Blackboard. I'll also email it out to you all. You'll be allowed to print it out and have it with you on the exam. If you need to give yourself an example of how to do it, you can you can draw on your chart as much as you want. All right, I'll give you another minute to work on this, and then we'll go over the answers. Yes, 
The Z table does not count against you for your cheat sheet. You're allowed to have your cheat sheet on one side and your Z table on the other side. Free response pretty much always has partial credit. The only part that won't have partial credit is the logic table because you get it or you don't. I mean, technically you can get part of the logic table correct, but there, there, there'll be 10, no, there are gonna be nine entries in the logic table that you have to find. It'll be one point each. So if you get five of them, you'll get five of the nine points. But everything else, absolutely partial credit, assuming you have something that deserves partial credit. All right, let's go over the answers. If you, if we were in class, I'd have people raise their hands, but not. So we'll start with the first one. If you're so willing to, type in chat what you think the probability associated with Z being less than negative 2.21 is. And then we will triangulate it. Point right. zero one three six. Hey, we had someone say it. All right. Everyone's getting the same thing, so let's double check. We have negative 2.2. That's right there. And then we have a point zero one at the end. Triangulate. There we go. Good work. Let's go to the next one. Go ahead and type in the one that you think it is for less than negative 0.13. And everyone has the same answer. We'll still double check. We have the negative 0.1. And then we have the 0.03. That's going to triangulate right there. Big fat long arrow. 0.4483. And now what is our last one? Yes, very big number. So here we have 2.9. And then we have a 0.01, draw our arrow on down, and we get 0.9982. Now, here's an interesting question. What happens if I ask you this? Now you're stuck. You don't have a formula to do that, but we actually do. Let's go back to chapter one. We know that the probability of being A is equal to the prob or is equal to one minus the probability of not being A. So put another way, we can say, and this is a law, you want to write this down, I'll scroll up and write down here. The probability of Z being greater than ZV is equal to one minus the probability of Z being less than ZV. And now that we have that, we can answer this one we have here. So this is gonna be equal to one minus the probability of Z being less than 1.4. So 1.4 right there, zero, zero, we triangulate 0.9192. So we'd have one minus 0.9192. And I believe that is point, I want to say 0808. The formula, oh yes, the formula is right here. Let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see it. This right here is the formula. You need to have this. Yes, Jordan. So the second formula is for whenever the sign is facing the other way. Yes. If, if the probability we're asking you for is just less than something, then you just do straight what we did the first time. If it's asking for greater, you first have to find the one that's less than and then subtract that off of one. Okay. That, so it needs to, okay, that makes sense. All right. And likewise, as another example, we recall the previous formula, probability, ZV, less than Z, less than ZW. You recall that one, I believe, was over here. There's that, if you don't have it written down. So therefore, what if I asked you the probability of our Z score being between negative 1.1 and 1.1. That'll be equal to the probability of our Z score being less than 1.1 minus the probability of that Z score being less than negative 
So we're going to have to use both sides of the table. Z is less than 1.1. That's positive. That's right there because we have the 0 0.00. So this one is going to be 0 0.8643. Z is less than negative 1.1. That's right here. So 0 0.1357. And that you can do it. And on the exam, of course, you'll have your calculator. So you don't have to do this in your head. And so that would be 0.7286. So to give you a visual, I have four visuals here. This one is a straight up application of looking at the table because we're asking Z being less than that, everything to the left. This one right here and this one right here is stuff in between. And that's an example of the one I just gave you there. So we can see to the right of negative 0.5 and to the left of 1.25. So here we subtract. And finally, this one is to the right. And so we take one minus to the left. You see, we get the probability of being to the left and then we subtract it from one to get the probability of being to the right. So I'll give you a couple of practice ones. So find the probability of your Z score being greater than let's say one and use the table. Uh, we have a couple, yes, uh, doesn't say whose hand. So just go ahead and unmute and ask. Uh, on, the last example, on the last example you just gave, um, does it, you always need to subtract the negative Z score from the positive one? You could have two positives. So for example, you could have one and two. In that case, you'd subtract the probability of one from the probability of two. Okay. Basically, you always subtract the probability of the lower one from the higher one if we ask you for the in-between. Okay. Jordan, did you have a question? Oh, no, I just forgot to lower my hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now practice once. And for this one, use a table. Don't use your empirical rule. So find the probability of Z being greater than one and also find the probability of Z being between negative one and one. Do, don't use the empirical rule. Use the table. So I'll give you about a minute to do this. Here's the table again if you need to triangulate. I'll give you about another minute. So to get the probability for being in between two Z values, you subtract the probability of being less than the lower value from the probability of being less than the higher value. So in this case, you would subtract the probability of our Z score being less than negative one from the probability of our Z score being less than one. All right, let's go and go over the answers. First of all, we use the complement rule for the first one. This is going to be equal to one minus the probability of Z being less than one. 
So Z, R1 is right there, zero is right there. We triangulate and we get 0.8413. This is one minus 0.8413, which I believe is 0.1587. Okay, now let's move on to the next one. This will be equal to the probability of our Z score being less than one minus the probability of our Z score being less than negative one. Well, we already got Z is less than negative one. That was right there. So that saves us a bit of time. So 0.8413. Now we need Z is less than negative one. That's right here. So 0.1587. So 0.1587, and if you want to pull up your calculator, that'll be 0.6826. And that's pretty much in line with what the empirical rule told us. Before we start going to applications, are there any questions about finding probabilities for ranges with z-scores? You don't need the empirical rule. I, I was just saying that's about what we'd expect from the empirical rule. For the actual exam, you won't use the empirical rule. You'll use the Z tables. Yes, you, uh, problem number four on the exam will be a Z score problem. You'll solve a system of two equations to get your... Uh, to, to get your mean and standard deviation back, which we went over in the previous lecture, I believe. And then you'll find the probability of being in between those two Z scores, which is this. And then the third part will be an interpretation of it. So let's get to the applications of this. Yes, Nicholas. Hi, I was just wondering, um, you said you upload the recordings right before the exam, right? I upload them the week of. So in this case, I have all I will have all of the lecture recordings uploaded before the start of the independent study day. So that way you can spend the independent study day working on it. Hopefully okay. we won't go over. I was just wondering because like for this whole um, chapter that we've been going through, I feel like I need a little bit more and I wanted to rewatch the lectures, but yeah. if you're not uploading them, is there anywhere you could suggest for us to go? Well, I'm uploading them. On YouTube or something? I will upload them. All right, cool. Yes, uh, they'll probably be uploaded by around Monday. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, Christopher, hopefully we don't go over time. So this one we just went over. So actually we just did an example of this. Let's not worry about it. We did an example of it. So yeah, we saved some time. Oh, uh, we, did, we did this one as well. Oh. We can go in reverse now. We can now go in reverse. Because we said the probability, let's say we have the probability of Z being less than one. I believe we calculated that as about 0.8413, I think. So let's suppose we went in reverse. And I asked you, what is the probability? Or oh no, no, no. What Z score has 84.13% of the data below it? So in this case, we have 0.8413. So here's what would happen. We would go back to our table and we look for 0.8413. Since that is greater than 50%, it's going to be over here. And the nice thing is if you look at these probabilities, they increase from left to right. Think of it like reading a book. 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15, 0 0.16
0.504 all the way to 0.5359 and then 0.358 keep going to the right so it increases like you're reading a book so we want to find 0.8413 so we read our book it's not there it's right there and that's the z-score so that's how we go in reverse so let's go back to that problem let me scroll up a little bit oh a bit to the left it asks us what is the value of z such that the probability of being less than that is 1.5 so put another way what z score we'll call it zv is associated with 0 0.015 so we're going to look for this value in our table so let's go back to the table so we read this from left to right. Oh, no, no, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. The left one, for the one on the left, you read it from right to left. So this one, you read it like a book from uh, right to left. And this one, think of it like bottom right. Because if you want to think of it another way, imagine if you stacked these on top of each other. The probabilities decrease. But either way, we're looking for 0.15. That's right here. So we can say this Z score is going to be what if you put either of those, say negative 0.296 or negative 0.297, I would take them both. So in this case, we would say that this Z value that gives this to us is 2.96, 2.97, I would take both. Let me give you another example just to reinforce the concept because I know that might be a bit confusing. Yes, that was point. No, 0. 0.015. Yes. Yes, I, I hope to have them uploaded by Sunday. So let's do this one. Let's say more than 30%. So what Z value has 0. 0.305 of the data above it? Yes, Kendra. The one that you just found, the 2.96 or 7, was for 0. 0.0015, is what I was saying. It's 0. 0.015, yes. I know, but the chart was correlating to 0. 0.0015. Oh, you're correct. I apologize. There we go, right there. So then that one, that, that'd be negative 2.17. I apologize. Thank you for pointing that out. So that one is negative 2.17. I apologize. And there should have been a sign there as well. Negative 2.17. I apologize. I forgot the zero. Thank you for pointing that out. So for this one, we want the z-score associated with being, basically with the z-value where 30.5% of the data is greater than it. First, we use our formula. So one minus P, because we, we have to put it in the form of the table because the table has everything to the left. So z is less than zv is going to be, technically there is, oh yeah, that's fine, negative 0.305 because we replace this with our formula. Now we add this to both sides and then subtract the 0 0.305. So 0 0.695 is equal to P of Z is less than ZV. Now we use our table. We're looking for this value. So 0 0.695 is right there. And that is a Z score of 0.51. So in that case, this would be Z is equal to 0.51. So let me give you an example. We'll go back down here so you have the table in front of you. Let's suppose, as a couple of examples, which Z score, so let me undo, Z score has... 1.07% below it. 
And what z-score has, let's say, 48.8% above it? So I'll give you a minute or two to work on this. Let me scroll down so you can see the full table. There you go. And if you'd like to, once you have your answer for both of them, you can type in the two answers in chat if you want. All right, does anyone need more time? All right, go ahead and type in what you think the Z-score is for the 1.07%. All right, in this case, we are looking for 0 0.0107. Looking, that that's right here. That's negative 2.3 and 0 0.00, so we get negative 2.3. You'll notice these problems are more so reading the table and as needed applying the complement law. Now, what about the second one? What's the z-score for this one? All right, so here we have to use the complement law because it says above, we have to put it in the form of below, so we need 1 minus 48.8%, which is 0 0.5120, I believe. I'm sorry, 4.5122. Sorry, 0 0.5122. There we go. No, is that point? No, 0 0.512. Yeah, it was right the first time. There we go. Yes, Jordan. Are there going to be any problems like this on the exam review? Yes. Okay, because there wasn't any um, like in the homework, and so I just was wondering so I can yes, practice the, it. Yes, the the mid the midterm exam review and the the two practice midterm exams should have problems like this. Okay, and I'll go you. over them in the video as well. So it's point five one two. Okay. So we're looking for point five one two. That's right here. So point oh three. So our z-score is 0.03. Let's move on to some applications. And from this point onwards, it technically shows up on the exam. But the way I've designed the exam, it kind of sort of guides you through it. So we will go over time. If you want, if you need to leave now and just would rather watch the video after I upload it, that's fine. So let me scroll up. Where'd it go? Here we are. So let's suppose, uh, hopefully maybe five to 10 minutes. So let's suppose we have some costs. They follow a normal distribution. The mean is 35,000 and the standard deviation is 10,000. We want to know if it's less than 40,000. We need to get a Z-score. But our Z-score formula, we recall, is our X value, which is 40,000. I'm just going to put 40K. And our mean is 35K. This is the formula from before. I'll write it down again in case you don't have it. 
So Xi minus mu over the standard deviation. Next Thursday, yes. So here our Xi is 40,000, our mu is 35,000, our standard deviation is 10,000. So we have 5,000 over 10,000, which is 0.5. And now this is the problem you've already seen before. Less than 40,000 is the same as the probability that Z is less than 0.5. Now, before I continue, does it make sense where this 0.5 came from? Okay, all, all you do is you take these numbers and throw them into the Z formula because we have to put everything into the Z scores because that's what our table wants. So we need less than 0.5. Going over to our table, 0.5 is 0.6915. So therefore, this probability is 0.6915, and that is our answer. So we can say that 69.15% of the costs are less than $40,000. So now, let's say... I asked for the probability of the cost being between 45 and 50,000. We need the Z scores for both. So 45,000, our mean is still 35,000. And the standard deviation is 10,000. So 10 over 10, our first Z score is one. Our second Z score, we have 50,000. Our mean is still 35,000. And the standard deviation is 10,000. So we have 15 over 10, 1.5. So we are essentially asking, what is the probability that our Z score is between one and 1 1.5? And therefore that's the probability of Z being less than 1.5 minus the probability of it being less than one. And now we have a problem that we already know how to solve. So we need 1.5 and one. 1.5 is right here, so that's 0.9332. So let's go write that down up here. So 0.9332, and now we need it being less than one. So one is right here, so 0.5398. And you put it into a calculator and we get 0.3934. So we can say that 39.34% of our costs are between 45 and $50,000. Does that make sense? All we're doing here is converting these numbers into Z scores. That's the only extra step we have. Once we have them in Z scores, same process as before. All right, in our final one, let's go in reverse with the extra step. So the average family, $75, the standard deviation of five on food per week, normally distributed. So first, get the Z-score. However, that's what we're trying to find. So we can get the Z-score first. So 10.03% of families spend X or more on food per week. So the probability of Z being greater than the Z value we're trying to find is 10.3%. So one minus P Z is less than ZV using our complement rule is 0 0.1003. Subtract this from both sides, add that. So 0 0.8997 is our probability we're looking for. This is now in the format we need for the table. So let's go to the table and find 0 0.8997. 0 0.8997 is right there. That has a 1.2 and a 0 0.08, so 1.28. So here, we know that ZV is equal to 1.28. Now the extra step, because we even want the money that corresponds to 1.28. So our Z score of 1.28 is going to be our X value minus our mean, which is 75, 
over the standard deviation of five. So now we solve for x. You'll notice the process started out the exact same as before. All we have is the extra step from going from z to x. In this case, we multiply our 1.28 by 5. So we have 6.4 is equal to x minus 75. Add 75 to both sides. And we have $81.40 is our x value. So we can say that 10.03% of the families spend more than $81.40 per week on food. Does it make sense what I did in these two examples here? All we did, we first have to get the Z value, and then it's the same problem as before. All right. If you'd like to leave now, you can. I will give a shortcut on replacement and non-replacement to save you some time on the hypergeometric and binomial distributions. You don't need it for the exam, but it might save you some time. So I'll go ahead and go over that. But you don't, you, you don't have to write down if you don't want to, because you can technically still solve the problems even without them. They're just shortcuts that I'd figure I'd share with you. So let's go to those shortcuts. I don't know if I gave you these formulas before. I'm going to assume I didn't. And I'm going to show you how we got them or how I got them. Uh, let's go up here because we have some space. So these four shortcuts have to do with the following question. Let's say we're picking items or let's say we're flipping a coin. And let's say we flip it 10 times. What are the odds of never getting ahead? So always tails. Well, we know that's the binomial probability of X being 10. And you can calculate that right now with the binomial distribution. But there's a shortcut you can do. And here's the shortcut. The odds of getting tails are 1 over 2. The odds of getting tails a second time are 1 over 2. Third time, 1 over 2, so on, so forth, up until 10 times. That is 1 over 2 to the power of 10, because 10 times. So therefore, that's the same as taking the product of one half 10 times. Now to put this in general terms, the probability of always getting A, so always A, is equal to the probability of getting A, in this case one half, to the power of 10, in this case n, the number of trials we do. So in this case, to explain how we get from this to this, I don't know why there's a, a one here, it should be one half. To explain how we get from this to this, the probability of getting tails is one half. We flip the toying 10 times, so we get 10. And you can put that into Desmos, it'll give you the answer. So that's one shortcut. Now let's suppose I ask you, what are the odds of never getting tails? In this case, we could calculate the odds of getting heads in 10 of uh, at least once and subtract that, or actually get getting heads 10 times and subtracting that from one, but we can use a shortcut. And here's our shortcut. The probability of not getting tails is one minus one half. That's our first trial. Not getting it again, one minus one half. And we keep doing it until our 10th time. So that's the same as doing one minus one half to the power of 10, because we did it 10 times, which is the product 10 times of one minus one half. So to put it in more readable terms, the probability of never getting A is equal to the probability of not getting A n times. And so again, to explain how we get from this to this, the probability of not getting A was 1 minus 1 half, and we do it 10 times, and we get this. 
Are there any questions with regards to these binomial shortcuts? Yes, Jordan. Hey, wouldn't one minus one half be the same thing as one half? Yes. So then it'd be and the same thing as the probability to get, of like always get A? Yes, in this case, for the case of flipping a coin, yes. And the reason why that works is because the probability is one half. If that probability is not one half, these two formulas won't give you the same answer. Gotcha, so if it was like one third, it would be different or like- Yes. Okay. Now, we have the same thing for hypergeometric. So in this case, we had replacement because when we flip the coin again, we can get tails again or we can get heads again. Let's suppose instead we're picking cards out of a deck and we're not putting them back in. That's no longer replacement, but we can still get shortcuts without replacement. Let me see where I have the extra space. Down here, we have some extra space down here. All the way in the bottom right. So let's suppose, let's go to the example we had in class. Someone have a question? Okay, so let's suppose we're picking those aces and we want to get all four aces. The odds of getting one ace on our first try are four out of 52 because there's four aces and there's 52 cards. Let's say we get that ace and we try again. Now there's only three aces left and there's 51 cards left in the deck. Let's try again. Now there's only two aces left and there's only 50 cards left in the deck. And now we'll try one more time. There's only one ace left and we have to get it. And there's 49 cards left. So the odds of getting all four aces are this. Because if we get aces all four times, you have to get an ace every time. So the odds of getting an ace the first time were four out of 52 because there were four aces and 52 cards. The next time we took a card out of the deck and it was an ace. So the number of aces goes down and the number of cards that goes down. So on and so forth. Now, let's go from the other end. What if we asked, like before, the probability of never getting an ace? Well, there are 48 cards in the deck that aren't an ace because 52 minus four. Let's suppose we don't get an ace. Now there's 47 cards in the deck that aren't an ace and we have 51 cards left. Now we took a non-ace out, so we have 46 cards in the deck that aren't an ace and we have 50 cards left. Finally, we take out another ace. There are 45 cards in the deck that aren't an ace and 49 left. And that'll give us this probability. You'll note with both of these, it saves us a ton of time because we don't have to use that big nasty formula. So now let's put this in general terms. Let's suppose, in this case, this is the probability of all aces. So we'll put all A. And this one is the probability of no A's. Here, we need to put it in this format. So when we start out with the first one, we had a total of four cards in the deck that were aces. If we recall from the definition of the hypergeometric distribution, R is the number of successes. And in this case, four successes. So we have R. And the total number of cards in the deck is 52, which we recall is capital N. On our next time, we take out an ace. So now we have R minus one aces left, and we have N minus one cards left. Now we do it again. We have R minus two aces left, and N minus two cards left. In the last time, we have R minus three cards left, oh, aces left, and N minus three cards left. So, that's the shortcut in that case. And to generalize it, the odds of getting all of the A's is equal to the product 
from i equals zero to r minus one. We can't say r because then we'd have zero over something and the probability becomes zero of n minus i times r minus i. So that's the formal probability definition. You can also write it out like this, whichever way you prefer. With no a, here's the only thing that changes. The number of a's was r, so therefore the number of no a's is n minus r. n is still the same. Now we took out one of those no a's, so we have n minus 1 minus r, and now n minus 1. And again, we took out another one, so n minus 2 minus r over n minus 2. And then our last one, we had n minus 3 minus r over n minus 3. We can write that in product notation as the product from i equals 0, again, to r minus 1, I believe. Yes, r minus 1 of n minus i minus r over n minus i. So now, th th that's really the formal definition. You can pick whichever one you want to write down. Are there any questions about where these came from? Okay, so now if we go back up here, I wrote them all down here. So now I'll wrote, work out a few practice problems with you and then we're good to go. So we pick four cards from a 52 card deck and getting all four is king. So since we're not putting these cards back in, it's hypergeometric and we're looking for always king. So we'll use this one. There's four kings in the deck. So we have the product from i equals zero. Actually, no, it should be n. Sorry, it should be n because we have uh, n trials. So here, that should be n minus one. Sorry, and we have a number of trials n. Let me fix this for you. Down here, this is n. Th this is still correct. This is correct. I just uh, wrote the wrong letter down. There we go. to n minus one. In this case, we're picking four cards. So four minus one of capital N, which is 52 cards minus I. Capital N is 52 minus R, which is four. So we have 52 minus 48 minus I. In this case, the first time if I is zero, we have, why did I put 48? Should be four. I apologize. Four. There we go. 52 minus 4 is 48, minus 0 is 0, 52. Next time, now i is 1, so 47 over 51. Now i is 2, so 46 out of 50. And now i is 3, because we stop at 3, 45 over 49. And that'll be our probability for the first one. Let's now just skip to... Number four, we pick four cards and we never get a queen. So we're not putting the cards back in. So that's hypergeometric. And we're asking the odds of never getting a queen. So that's this one. So we have the product form. Again, we start at zero. We go to n minus one. We're picking four cards. So that's four minus one. And in this case, we... Oh, I this this was part four. I'm sorry. We already did that one. We're doing part one now. Sorry. <laughs> Forgot which one I was doing. So we're actually doing part one. So we pick four cards and they're all kings. So here, that's this one. I apologize. I forgot which one I was doing. So now we have four kings minus i. Because we should have r minus i and then 52 minus i. So here... I starts at zero, so four out of 52, 
Now we subtract one off of each, three over 51, subtract two, two out of 50, and then subtract three, because that's where we stop, one out of 49, and that's our answer to part one. So this is one, and this is four. Now our other one, let's do part three. We roll a fair six-sided die four times, and we never get a one. Since we're rolling the same die over and over, we have replacement, so that'll be binomial, and we never get a one, so that's going to be the never. So for three, this is equal to the probability of not rolling a one to the power of n. In this case, the probability of not rolling a one is equal to one minus the probability of rolling a one. So that'd be one minus one sixth, the power of n, which is four times. So that's gonna be five six to the power of four. That's it. You'll notice that makes it much easier on you for calculations. And now for part two, there's a 1% chance of dropping a charm. We want the probability of getting all three. This is replacement because you're killing different ones. So we'll use binomial. And we always want to get a charm. So that's going to be this one. The probability of getting it is 0.1%. So one over 100. And we try it three times. Power of three, you're done. 